Dead millionaire sex parties? Wait a minute, how can there be a window there? Vengeful native ghosts? How did he get out? Apollo 11, really? Where's the plug? Why did he change the number? Hey, where did that chair go? The devil? And what is that supposed to mean? Bears, bears. There are a lot of these threads in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. People get so obsessed with it, they made a movie about people getting obsessed with it. But none of these threads really lean anywhere, except deeper into the maze of the movie. The Shining is a movie about being trapped in a relationship with an alcoholic, narcissistic, abusive gaslighter. And to make its point, the movie lies to you. It manipulates you. It messes with your perception of reality. And it offers all sorts of excuses to why it is happening, to lead you to believe that if you try really hard, maybe you can understand it, when that is not possible. In short, The Shining is gaslighting you. Now, it's no secret that the original author, Stephen King, hates this movie. But he wasn't even alone. When the movie came out, reviewers kind of hated it, calling it technically accomplished, but chilly and emotionally distant. Yeah, it's true. Look at all that reserved emotion there. But we'll come back to that. Let's stay with King for a second. The Shining is one of King's most personal books. He said that he was massively abusing drugs and alcohol while he was writing it. It's clear from reading the book that he thought substance abuse was destroying his and his family's life. In fact, I think he rather bravely wrote the book as a way to start dealing with this. So to him, Jack Torrance, while still being a terrifying figure, is not unsavable. He can't be, because in writing it, King's trying to save himself. To King, the spirits that are haunting the Overlook are beatable. In fact, in the end, Jack momentarily overcomes them, sets off the boiler, and blows up the hotel, saving Danny and Wendy. It's a very empathic and forgiving view of a tragic character, written by a person who desperately needed empathy and likely needed to forgive himself for the damage that he caused to his own family. Kubrick's film, however, has a slightly different take. That take is, f*** this guy. So it's no wonder why King hates the film. King wants to find a way to love Jack, while Kubrick wants us to laugh at him when he dies. Further, King saw Wendy of the movie as a misogynistic interpretation. He had written Wendy to be heroic, in the same way that I'm sure that he felt his wife was heroic in saving him and his family from the pain that he had brought them. So it's understandable that he was offended when he saw Kubrick's version where Wendy is represented as a meek and broken person. So why did Kubrick make this massive change? The big key to me comes in the casting. Kubrick is particularly great at casting actors because he didn't just think about whether they play the role well. He thought about what the audience thought of the actor before the movie even starts, like casting sex symbol Ryan O'Neill as Barry Lyndon and putting him up against some of the best English actors of the time. So Barry looks like a total dumbass who's out of his depth. Or casting the sarcastically charming James Mason as Humbert Humbert. So we sort of wryly laugh at all of his pedophilic criminal behavior for the first two thirds of Lolita. But with The Shining, he took it to a new level because nobody, even at that time, played put upon showboating selfishness like Jack Nicholson. The role of Jack Torrance fit Jack Nicholson so well, I don't think he's really stopped playing it since. So this tells us what Kubrick really thinks is scary. Kubrick thinks of Jack Torrance as the worst kind of horror, and it's the heart of the film. Jack, like most of Kubrick's villains, is a malignant narcissist. See also Jack D. Ripper, Claire Quilty, General Paul Moreau, Alex DeLarge, and most tellingly, HAL 9000. Kubrick didn't see people like Jack as human. He saw them as self-involved, murderous robots. Meanwhile, for Wendy, instead of casting someone who's perceived as strong, like Jill Clayburgh or Julie Christie, he casts the minimally physical, slight-voiced Shelley Duvall. So from the first frame, she looks like she's going to be crushed just by Jack's ego. Now, for a long time, there's been a story that Kubrick basically tortured Duvall into giving this performance. And I'm as guilty of pushing that story as anybody. But after I became more familiar with her work, like Robert Altman's Popeye, Three Women, and Nashville, in which she is fantastic, I started to get a little suspicious of this rumor. And in a Hollywood Reporter interview, Duvall went a long way to debunking this as well, saying that, well, Kubrick had that streak in him they considered each other equal creative partners and she's really proud of the film so now i look back and i think man it's a little bit weird that we bought into this idea that the only way a woman could give this performance was by being terrified into it instead of you know just being a really goddamn good actor and that brings me back to the initial reception of the movie it's easy to give Jack Nicholson credit for his performance in The Shining because it's scary, but it's super entertaining. Jack Torrance is a showstopper. He's a big, crazy, quotable, good time of a bad guy. But in 1980, it was much harder for us to credit Shelley Duvall. Not only did a lot of critics call her as being silly, she was even nominated for a Razzie, like next to Olivia Newton-John and Xanadu. No offense to Miss Newton-John, your music is awesome, but nobody should ever have to watch that movie. King himself said that this version of Wendy reduced the character to being a kind of screaming dish rag. I think this is because our egos want a clear hero here. Someone who represents how brave we think we would be in that situation. And that's not how these kinds of situations work. Kubrick is not making a movie about a woman whose husband turns evil during the movie. He's making a movie about a woman whose husband is evil from before the movie starts. And the fact is that people whose ego has been systematically destroyed day after day over years of narcissistic manipulation 
do not present themselves as bold go get em heroes. In reality, it takes all of their strength to get through the day. They live in nothing but fear. Wendy is not Ripley. She's a woman who's been married for years to an abusive, alcoholic, narcissistic gaslighter. So at the start of the film, she's already on the edge, and then Jack puts her through two hours of grinding horror that not only ends up with her life in danger, but her son's as well. Duval is not here to show us our heroic self. She's here to hold up a mirror. If you look at it that way, I think you'll agree with me that this is one of the greatest performances ever put to film. Up there with Gene Hackman in The Conversation, or Maria Falconetti in The Passion of Joan of Arc. Because it doesn't simply represent us, it challenges us. And I don't just mean this for the raw emotions that she has to keep up for months worth of shooting. I mean, look at her in this scene. As the Death by Toys company pointed out with its awesome, shining tie-in, Wendy's Cigarette Ash. This is a scene about a person who is trying so hard to pretend that her life is fine that she can't even move or it'll fall apart. She is trying to pretend that her child is not massively mentally scarred and exhibiting all sorts of behavior that indicates sustained abuse. She knows that Danny's in terrible danger even as she is describing and excusing the fact that Jack has already broken Danny's arm in a drunken rage. And why would she protect Jack? She's not protecting Jack, she's protecting Danny. She doesn't want Jack to be set off again to do even more damage. Wendy is someone whose love of her child and fear of her husband has trapped her into a codependent spiral of denial and violence. The picture starts and Jack has already pulled Wendy and Danny into his narcissistic maze of lies, pity, excuses, and emotional terrorism, and we haven't even gotten to the damn hotel yet. That sounds like a horror movie. This is not a bad performance, this is a film-defining performance. So why do people laugh at it? Because it's the only way to protect ourselves from it. Because it so honestly represents a kind of real-life horror that we don't want to admit that we could fall prey to. It's easy, sitting in the audience, to judge characters on screen. By reframing this very real kind of horror into a haunted house, Kubrick can manipulate us the same way that Jack does Wendy. When we are in a relationship with a narcissist or gaslighter, they want us to believe that the problem is an external one. It isn't them, it's some outside force. And if we can only solve that, you'll be safe from all the horror. Wendy, it's the alcohol, it's not me. So the codependent deal we make with them sounds something like this. As long as there's no alcohol, Danny is safe. Don't worry, Wendy, there are rules. Wendy, I'm never gonna touch another drop. And if I do, you can leave me. The film makes the same bargain with us. We are scared and we don't want to be scared. Understanding what's causing that fear will make us less scared. So the film gives us blind alleys, dead-end symbols, and ghosts to chase. Duvall's performance is so troubling because the chances are pretty good at some point we've experienced it. Maybe it's happened to us. Maybe it's happened to a family member or a parent. But the deepest fear the film represents is also its very point. Narcissists keep us trapped with the promise of control. But the hardest and most frightening thing to realize is that we have control all along. We can leave. But leaving is terrifying, and in some cases, it can be life-threatening. If you ask anyone who's been in this situation, this is when the danger becomes real. Once we break a deal with the narcissist, the problem that must be solved in the relationship is no longer an external force. The problem is us. And there's no way to know whether we or our loved ones will make it out unhurt. That's the trap. This is the horror that has to be faced. And this is what The Shining simulates for us. In the end, Kubrick's hard advice is give up the dead ends, give up the excuses, give up the lies, and give up the ghosts. Because it's all a trap to keep you there. Whether you're in a toxic relationship or a haunted house, there's only one thing to do. Get the fuck out.